Hello, here's a favorite book, Louis the Fourteenth by Vincent Cornyn, published by Penn Books in 1964. He was King of France for about 60 years in the um, crossing the 17th and 18th century, and a remarkable man. His was arguably the cleverest head ever to wear a crown. He was born in 1638 with two teeth at birth, and I'm told just one in 2,000 babies is born with teeth. Educated by a dozen expert tutors overseen by the superintendent of the education of the king, Cardinal Mazarin, Mazarin, you're probably supposed to say, he became king in 1654 at the age of just 15. In 1661, after Mazarin's death, he announced that he would be his own prime minister. He reduced taxes on the starving peasants and cut expenses to fix his country's financial problems. He married young, but as was accepted at the time, he quickly began to take mistresses. One very pious duke, who was also a respected war veteran, accosted him one day, saying, Sire, the Archangel Gabriel has commanded me to remonstrate with your majesty on the subject of his immoral relations with Mademoiselle de la Valliere. There was a long and awkward silence. Then Louis said, I always knew you were touched there, fixing his eyes on the Duke's battle-scarred brow and tapping his own. In the late 1660s, Louis plotted war against Holland. He did so first and foremost in order to cover himself with glory, says Cronin. But long before Louis approached the frontier, the Dutch had already made plans to stymie him by um, opening their dikes and flooding their whole country. And that's what happened. There's another couple of important things he did. One is concerning the Code Noir, the Black Code published in 1685 to improve the lot of slaves in the West Indies. Slaves were to be baptized if they wished and not forced to work on Sundays and holidays. They were allowed to marry. Masters who abused their authority were in future liable to punishment. A scale of food, clothing and care during sickness was laid down. It was forbidden to sell separately a husband and wife and children under age. Emancipation, freedom of slaves, was made easier, and a master over 20 might free a slave without formality. The Code Noir was an outstanding humanitarian measure far in advance of its time. And another incident just mentioned on the same page, jewels. When he came to power, duels were the curse of France. In 1654, the Maréchal de Cramou reckoned that in the past 12 years, 940 gentlemen had died in that way. There was a duel in 1663 between eight combatants, which determined Louis to suppress the practice once for all. He did so, thus succeeding where two previous kings had failed, and all Europe followed France's example. With something else, he was a loyal Catholic, and he decided that he would make his whole country Catholic. There was a large group of Protestants in France called the Huguenots. With preaching and pressure, many of them converted, but by no means all. So his next step was draconian. He ordered all Protestant services to cease and their churches to be demolished. All their children were to be baptized as Catholics. At the time, everyone, except the Protestants, of course, thought this was just the right thing to do. In the next few years, more than 200,000 of the Huguenots left France. And another interesting thing here, Louis was a patron of the arts. Literature, architecture, painting, sculpture and music all flourished. He had the wonderful palace of Versailles built, which you can visit just out of Paris. Another interesting little snippet, the billiards incident. 
Louis was very fond of billiards. One day he was playing before a group of courtiers when a quarrel arose over a disputed shot. Louis called in the Comte de Grammont, who was seated nearby, to settle the differences. Sire, replied Grammont, without moving, you are in the wrong. What, sir, said Louis, you didn't even see the shot. If there had been the slightest doubt about the shot, sire, the gentleman watching would have cried that you were in the right. <laughs> Okay, Louis' achievements started a debate. Was France in his time superior to the peaks of classic Greece and Rome? People began to believe so. This was a new idea in Europe. Previously, everyone had believed that the classical world was the best ever and everything subsequent was a decline. But it began to be believed that Louis had surpassed it in his France of his time and so belief in progress was born. That's an important thing. And a little bit more from page 356. Uh, he's an old man now in his 70s, and um, his son Ania dies, and then the next in line, his grandson, also dies. Overwhelmed with grief, the king was working towards uh, an explanation of what had gone wrong. He had suffered military defeats, famine, the loss of four of his closest family within a year. Were these things a coincidence? The religious ferment of its age had left its mark on Louis, and where, as a young man, he might have seen only a series of chance events, he now became aware gradually, not abruptly, of a definite pattern, more than a pattern, a drama, the sense of which was this. The terrible events were a punishment, personal punishment. He, the king, had innocent blood on his hands, particularly the blood shed in 1672. It's the time when he decided to invade Holland. For a man as proud as Louis, this was not an easy admission. Even when it was made, several attitudes were open to him. He might pit himself in revolt against punishments, so cruel. Or he might disclaim his guilt, shift responsibility for the Dutch war onto his advisers. A third course lay open, a course which had been taken by a great king more than 2,000 years before. A king in so many ways like Louis that his name kept cropping up in sermons and papal letters. David, the dancer, David, the player on stringed instruments, David, the warrior, David, the lover, David, the builder of a great cedarwood house. He, too, had become puffed up with glory and made war too often, so that the Lord resolved to punish him, sending a plague that killed 70,000 of his people and embroiling his kingdom in a disastrous war, which cost the life of his favorite son. And through his prophets, the Lord explained these disasters to the king. You are a man of war and have shed blood. Louis had special reason to remember this predecessor for a painting of King David hung in his bedroom beside his plumed four-poster bed. At night, when the candles were snuffed out, the two kings were alone together, and perhaps it was during these nights that Louis came to realize how disastrously he had gone amiss. He was guilty of more than the Dutch War of 1672. For fifty years he had dedicated his life to political and military glory, to more and more fortresses, surmounted by the white standard with golden lilies, which all other flags must respectfully salute. Now the fortresses lay in ruins, the flag of glory shot to pieces, and since he was going, growing old, past repair. It was borne upon the aging king that his pursuit of glory had been a terrible mistake, worse than a mistake, a sin, which even such grandiose schemes as the conversion of French Protestants could not cover, and for which he was now paying with the lives of those he loved best. In this sudden, otherwise total darkness, there was one glimmer of light. Louis recognized his sin, recognized that he was the one to blame, and that the punishment was just. He did not revolt, he accepted. It was too late now to put things right. 
For the moment, all that remained was to plead that France might not be taken from him, to plead for mercy as once David had done. O oh God, how numerous are my enemies, what a multitude rises up against me. Like silver you have tried me in the melting pot. Heal me, God, for my bones are trembling. I am exhausted with weeping. Every night my couch is bathed in tears. When, O oh God, will you forgive me? So, a very interesting thing that happened to him at the end of his life. Normal histories don't usually take much note of that sort of thing. They're not interested in that sort of thing. But I'm glad that this book of Cronin's does record it because to me it's it's a very significant thing the way this very proud and high achieving king humbled himself right at the end of his life he died very shortly after that uh, it's 1755 just a few days before his 77th birthday